Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning and good evening to those who are joining us uh, online and from afar. My name is Robin Geis and I'm the director of UNIDIR uh, and it's my great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us uh, in discussing what we at UNIDIR feel is clearly a priority of our times, artificial intelligence beyond weapons in military operations generally and beyond just weapon systems. That will be the focus of our side event and the discussion uh, here today. As many uh, of you in the audience uh, will be aware, UNIDIR contributes impartial, independent, evidence-based research to help inform ongoing debates on disarmament and international security issues more broadly. And for those who are less uh, familiar with UNIDIR, we're a voluntarily funded autonomous uh, institution within the United Nations, and really one of the few, perhaps one of the only uh, policy institutes worldwide that is working on arms control, disarmament specifically, and of course also uh, how they relate more broadly to global security issues. Uh, we are impactful and successful as an organization if we can help to assist the international community to develop practical, hopefully innovative ideas, urgently needed to find solutions to critical security problems in very challenging times indeed. Today's uh, side event has been organized by our security and technology uh, program, one of the core programs at UNIDIR. And the SecTech program, this is the acronym, works on a wide range of technologies, both old and new, and also how they converge with one another. And this includes cyber, of course, artificial intelligence, lethal autonomous weapon systems, and uncrewed systems. And um, this side event relates to our work, obviously, in the area of artificial intelligence. Since all the work that we do uh, is funded by our donors as a voluntary funded organization, this is how it works for UNIDIR. Let me take uh, this opportunity to thank all of our donors and partners without whom side events like this, and in fact, all of our work would otherwise not be possible Thank you all very much for supporting UNIDIR. Now, uh, the topic of uh, today's uh, discussion is uh, crucially important, I think, in the global security context, but also for UNIDIR, and I'm proud and delighted to say that we already prioritized artificial intelligence research some years ago when it wasn't yet mainstream uh, and as inflationary as perhaps now it is, but rightly so. Um, I think um, the uh, new Agenda for Peace very rightly highlighted the central role of artificial intelligence uh, and that it will grow exponentially in years to come in the global security arena. And so with this event and really all our research work in this field, uh, we're trying to follow step. So far, there has, of course, as all of you will be aware, a lot of attention on lethal autonomous weapon systems, the application of artificial intelligence within uh, weapon systems, and rightly has this debate focused and centered around humanitarian, ethical, legal, and policy implications of AI when applied in weapons systems. This topic is urgently important. UNIDIA has devoted a lot of attention and resources and work and time uh, to this topic, but we also feel it is only the tip of the iceberg, uh, really. We feel that beneath this tip of the iceberg, there is artificial intelligence as it will be applied in military operations across the board. And it is this more holistic and more comprehensive field that we want to address with our uh, panel here today. Let me just say, there are benefits and there are significant risks in artificial intelligence. It holds great promise for improving the speed and accuracy of military decision-making, military planning, military operations. It's a tool really for process optimization across the board and one that can help to fuse the massive amounts of data and big data that are collected today from all military domains, whether it's land, air, sea, or outer space. Especially in combination, I think, with robotic platforms and next generation sensor technology, there is a vast spectrum of potential military applications for artificial intelligence, and in coming years, we will only see these become a reality. And now clearly, with an enabling technology as powerful and as transformative as artificial intelligence, there are also significant risks. The list of risks is quite long, and I look forward to all of them being 
addressed in our discussion here, there are risks of inadvertent escalation, risks of misperception with an entirely new and very fast-moving technology, and of course there are risks of malfunctioning. Then there are concerns about unpredictability, about bias and the black box problem, the lack of transparency. And above all, AI, of course, raises profound ethical and legal questions about human agency and human control, especially in matters of life and death. So clearly, the technology is not moving incrementally, uh, quite the contrary. And therefore, as the Secretary General pointed out, it is high time for us to address this issue. And with this, I'll now hand over to Giacomo Percy Paoli, who's the master of ceremony and the moderator of this event, and I very much look forward to the discussion, uh, and both on the panel and with our audience. Thank you very much, and over to you, Giacomo. Thank you, Robin, for your uh, uh, remarks, and uh, uh, allow me to, to, to join you in welcoming all of you, whether you're here in the room uh, with us or joining us online. It is truly a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, engage with you all on a topic that, as Robin said, is of uh, great importance. Uh, it's been on our uh, research agenda for a while, and we're really um, uh, grateful that it has catalyzed enough attention to fill up the room here uh, in New York and also have such a great participation online. Um, before I introduce uh, you to our uh, excellent uh, guest speakers today, I have a few housekeeping and administrative points. Um, there will be time for, uh, for Q&A uh, after the interventions of our speakers. So. Even if you have a burning question after one of the presentations, please take note of it and uh, do not hesitate to ask for the floor um, when we open uh, uh, the, the Q&A part. For those of you that are joining us online, you can use the chat and then um, you know, send your question in writing and I will do my best to, to pass it to the speakers. Uh, or if you would like to take the floor uh, online, just uh, uh, make the, the, the request uh, again on the chat and. Uh, the host will, will uh, give you the floor when I indicate that you can uh, ask your question directly. Just for everyone's awareness, this meeting will be recorded and will be made available on Unidir's uh, website and YouTube channel uh, after the event. So for those of you who want to share it with colleagues um, or find the presentations particularly useful, you will be able to access the entire recording of this event um, uh, later in the coming days, as soon as we receive the recording from our uh, UN colleagues. Um, I would like now to introduce the, to you our uh, excellent, excellent speakers that we have on the panel today. So starting uh, on my left with uh, uh, Reto Wolman, the Deputy Head Section of Arms Control uh, with the uh, Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Next to him, uh, Beza Unal, the Head of the Science and Technology Unit with UN ODA. And then pivoting on my right, uh, Andrew Lon, Senior Fellow at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, uh, CSAT. And last but not least, here on my immediate right, uh, my colleague uh, Sarah grant Clemon, uh, a researcher at UNIDIR and also the, uh, the PI, the Principal Investigator and Lead Author of the report that is titled just like the event today and has been launched last week. So we know that uh, some of you may have had the time during the weekend to read it, but uh, in case you haven't, uh, Sarah is also going to start with uh, uh, a short uh, presentation to bring you all up to speed on what were some of the key highlights and findings of this work that we, uh, we just recently launched. So in turn, everyone will take the floor and, and share their, uh, their views. Uh, as I mentioned, we will start with an overview of the study findings from uh, Sarah, and then I will call on other speakers as, as the, the hour progresses. So with that, uh, I'm just gonna ask my colleague Wenting online, if you can please share the slides, and then uh, listen to the, uh, the kind of instructions from Sarah as to when to advance the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Giacomo. And um, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, so as mentioned, today I'm going to present an overview of the findings from um, the, my study, which examined the uh, application and impact of artificial intelligence, or AI, to military tasks beyond applications relating to the use of force and the narrow tasks of target selection and target engagement within the targeting process. Um, so next slide, please. 
so before discussing the findings, however, uh, I just want to take a moment to explain the reasons for uh, this examination of AI or examination of AI in this context. Uh, so until uh, recently, the focus of discussions and debates uh, within the United Nations in particular with regard to the use of AI for military purposes was primarily on issues relating to target selection and target engagement, tasks which I will refer to as downstream uses of AI. Yet, AI can be applied uh, to many other tasks which occur in a military operation, uh, such as analysis of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance data, logistics, um, training of personnel, to name but a few. Um, and I'll name these tasks upstream tasks going forward. And um, there has been a lesser focus uh, on AI inclusion in these upstream tasks, yet these can have uh, indirect consequences or impact on the use of force. Uh, examining AI beyond weapons and considering the wider application of AI is particularly relevant given ongoing discussions uh, on governance of AI and responsible use of AI for military purposes. The aim, therefore, um, that the, is for these findings, the ones which you can find in the report, um, to be integrated in subsequent thinking, deliberations, and actions on such topics, um, expanding beyond the narrow confines of AI application to um, weapon systems, which, while relevant, does not encompass the full extent of AI capabilities in the military domain. So uh, I will give a brief overview of the contents of the report to start off with, uh, and then go on to the main findings. Uh, Next slide, please. So the first step that was taken was defining the elements or military tasks which comprise a military operation uh, in order to then be able to map um, AI capabilities to these tasks. Um, in total, we identified 18 military tasks, which uh, you can see on the screen, which we divided into four functional areas. So the first, uh, command and control, or C2, refers to the decision-making uh, aspect of a military operation. Uh, for the study, tasks under the C2 functional area uh, primarily focus on the analysis elements in support of military decision-making and planning, as opposed to um, the conduct of military action, which falls outside of the present study scope. Um, if we look at the next slide, um, you'll see the other three um, uh, functional areas, the first being um, information management, which refers to the collecting, processing, exploiting, and disseminating, dissemination of information relating to a uh, military operation. Um, the third is uh, logistics, uh, which refers to the movement, supply, and monitoring of personnel and equipment to sustain a military operation. And the fourth is training, which refers to the instruction and preparation of military personnel. Um, going to the next slide, um, what we did was, uh, having mapped the kind of military tasks, we then identified uh, relevant AI capabilities, which and then mapped these against the identified military tasks. Um, sometimes studies can present AI capabilities in a very general sense, um, such as saying that AI can help um, analyze data. Um, but here. We want it to be more precise, and I know that for people in the room, you probably can't quite see it, but you can see it on the report. Um, and we wanted to showcase the specifics um, to help demystify AI and provide detail on exactly what AI can or can't do. Um, so due to time constraints, I won't go through all the 18 military tasks and their associated AI capabilities, um, but I'll just briefly explain how the mapping works. Um, so the mapping provides current AI capabilities, um, as well as feasible near future uh, capabilities. Uh, we set this uh, near future nominally to 2035. Uh, we felt that this time frame was um, uh, suitable to uh, examine realistic future technological development, but we didn't want people to um, discuss AI in um, maybe uh, exaggerated terms. We wanted to keep it within the bounds of kind of realistic um, foresight. So we wanted to avoid any outlandish claims around AI capabilities when looking at future capabilities. Um, and importantly, I should note that this mapping pertains to the state of play and the technical feasibility of AI currently and in the near future, and not the level of adoption of AI by different actors, because this will obviously differ. Um, of course, um, while putting together this mapping, it should be noted that 
there were different opinions about the existence of various capabilities, notably depending on the stakeholders who were consulted, depending on whether where you know where they came from um, and what type of actors they were. Um, so here, the tables aim to show the consensus views, um, but they do acknowledge and uh, in some places clearly outline uh, that alternative opinions did exist uh, during the kind of um, analysis and the data gathering, um, and this is particularly relevant given the rapidly advancing pace of technology. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just mention a few of the overarching elements which emerged from this mapping. Um, the report goes into a lot more detail, but briefly, um, first, a wide range of capabilities are currently technically feasible uh, within the 18 uh, military tasks. Um, however, the existence or future existence of these capabilities does not necessarily imply or mean that they will be integrated in uh, military tasks or military operations more widely. Indeed, there are a range of factors which impact adoption of AI beyond technological capability. Uh, second, uh, many of the near future AI capabilities place uh, an emphasis on AI capabilities which center around the transformation of data into knowledge, as well as systems which can learn, adapt, and react to changing information. Um, however, um, these near future capabilities uh, primarily feature um, AI which demonstrate an enhancement uh, of existing capabilities rather than groundbreaking revo uh, revolutions in AI, which are not expected in the near future, at least as uh, it regards these specific military tasks. Um, and fourth, um, I just want to highlight the relationship between AI and data, where AI is used to assist with data, but is also highly dependent on it, uh, demonstrating that issues of data integrity, quality, veracity are all going to remain key going forward and also raises a question whether enough attention is being paid to data issues versus solely the AI capabilities themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, alongside the mapping uh, that uh, is presented in the study, um, we also examined the uh, impact. Um, so both the impact that we uh, that is or could be uh, could emerge from utilizing AI to aid with these um, non-lethal military tasks, and subsequently divided these between strengths and opportunities and limitations and challenges. So first, looking at the strengths. Um, I won't have time to go through them one by one, but I just wanted to highlight a couple. Um, if you could just click on, please. Um, namely, it was noted that um, AI being able to process such large amounts of data can help make faster um, assessment uh, of, of this data than by human means, um, and this could therefore have an impact on the pace of analysis and thus decision making. Um, and it should be noted that you know, this increased speed could have knock-on effects and impact the downstream tasks, um, including those related to the use of force. Um, so for example, uh, more granular multi-domain analysis of data and courses of action can enable or, or speed up subsequent decisions regarding target selection and target engagement. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> However, um, Alongside these strengths and opportunities, a number of limitations and challenges were also identified. And these um, issues raised fall into three main uh, categories. Uh, the first is externalities that affect the proper use of AI. Uh, the second is concern about AI um, in and of itself. Uh, and the third is negative impacts resulting from the use of AI, with the majority of the issues that emerged as centered around this third broad category. And many of these reflections uh, are, not, are not novel. They exist uh, in the literature, in the uh, discussion that's uh, already ongoing uh, regarding the application of AI to weapon systems and specifically the use of lethal force. Um, and this therefore demonstrates that such issues have a broader remit um, and that these concerns um, are, are broader with regards to the application of AI more generally um, as regards military AI. Um, here, too, I'll just highlight a couple of elements, if you can just click on, please. Um, really, the issue of uh, human control is pervasive across all tasks, even those deemed uh, to have a low risk impact. Um, 
Indeed, even if the issue does not relate to a target or whether or not to pull a trigger, the questions still remain around the extent to which analysis, <coughs> the conception of pathways for action or tactics could or should be done by AI alone, and therefore if and when to include meaningful human control. Um, overall, discussions regarding meaningful human control may be just as relevant to the upstream tasks as they are to the downstream ones. And linked to the point on uh, black box, which um, Robin mentioned in his uh, introductory remark, um, uh, there, you know, th this is um, an issue. AI does not reason like us. We do not reason like AI. Um, and also, one example which uh, not should be noted here is um, the issue of uh, kind of hallucinations, which is particularly relevant to large language models, um, generative AI. Uh, so the type of AI which is used in ChatGPT, and this is really the where we see large language models inventing facts due to their misinterpretation of data or making incorrect associations between different uh, data or using poison data to make its um, uh, to, to help with the output. Um, and next slide, please. So just before I close, I want to touch upon a few overarching remarks and conclusions. Uh, first, the ex examination of the impact of AI on the upstream military tasks shows many similarities um, in the discussion pertaining to that of the downstream tasks. Um, indeed, as I mentioned previously, the inclusion of AI in upstream tasks uh, could have uh, or would have an impact on the downstream ones, uh, as well as the broader conduct of a military operation. Second, the operationalization of AI and upstream tasks may be, in some cases, less controversial for decision makers, given there is no um, lethal, um, immediate lethal impact, um, and might make the integration of AI more likely. Um, this could be due to it also being less visible uh, and less kind of problematic um, within kind of then compared to the um, upstream um, in the upstream tasks compared to the downstream tasks. Um, and lastly, uh, these elements demonstrate that AI capabilities relating to both upstream and downstream military tasks should be included in discussions on AI for military purposes, particularly in light of issues relating to governance and responsible AI. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, you can access the report uh, through our website. Um, and for those in the room, you should have a flyer with a QR code on it. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sarah, for the sprinting through uh, the report and uh, a research study that took, uh, I think, over a year by the time from, from when we started to when we finished. Um, so, in fact, you have a flyer. If you're in the room with us, there is a flyer on the desk that you can uh, use to access the report. And I may ask our uh, colleague uh, online if you can please post in the chat the link to the report for those that are following us online and they can access it uh, right away. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to uh, Andrew um, and really give us like, an overview of your perspective on the pace of AI development and its adoption in the military domain. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm not incorporated inside of any of the militaries, uh, so I can only speak to from my external perspective. Uh, but I think that I can kind of answer that at a, at a big picture in just a sentence or two. Uh, Basically, I, I don't see the, the militaries developing at the same uh, speed and scale as the, uh, as the big tech giants. Uh, I see them more as a, a fast follower and incorporator. And, and there may be pockets where that's less true than, than others, but, um, but even at that point, I think that that leads us to a, a whole set of, of other considerations. I'll try to uh, lay out three uh, high-level considerations and then, and then put a little bit of I try to concretize them a little bit. And the first one that I see is related to actually the conclusion that, that Sarah just provided. Uh, I think that in there are many cases outside of the actual weapon systems where uh, you can have risks that are that are at similar scales to the weapon systems, but because of uh, but, but um, because they're a little bit hidden, get less scrutiny than than others are, are provided. Um, another thing, I think it's possible that in a mili the military context is uh, different enough that the lessons learned from the industrial context might not apply very smoothly. And so we could learn the wrong lessons in incorporating into military these, uh, these private or, or, or popular technologies. And then also, 
I think that there are a bunch of risks that we just haven't thought through fully enough. Uh, risks, also some opportunities, um, and that they might be more important in this military context, but also just kind of more broadly. And so I'll walk through those kind of in reverse with a little bit of, of concrete side. Uh, uh, I work in the cyber AI project, and so I think a lot about cybersecurity, and I'll start by talking about, about some of these problems that aren't fully thought through uh, from the yet, and that, that's what we're here to do, is start thinking through more of these ideas. Uh, and and uh, the examples I'll, I'll lay out are from cybersecurity. So the RSA conference is the, like the premier, at least in, in the United States, uh, cyber defense conference. I was just there uh, this year, this spring, and AI had taken over basically every talk in the conference. And at least three different keynotes that I went to um, talked about the Nigerian prince scams and how now with AI we're going to be able to make more convincing, or we're going to face more convincing threats from the Nigerian prince who's trying to scam us into sending money to free them so they can send us more money in response. But uh, the Nigerian prince scams still exist with the Nigerian prince uh, label. You get a, an email from the Nigerian prince. Presumably, these Nigerian princes know that the that Nigerian that saying they're a Nigerian prince is suspicious, and their grammatical errors are also suspicious. Uh, it turns out, uh, at least there's been some analysis done uh, years ago now, that the Nigerian prince scam was so obvious on purpose that if you if you're sending out these scams, you it takes some effort to be able to, in, to interact with the with the targets of these scams. And if when you get to the point of asking for the credit card number, they're gonna all disappear, then you've wasted a lot of effort as an attacker. And so this is one of those cases where they're intentionally obvious about who they are and how, how scam they're. They're trying to filter out anybody who's not gullible. And so the, the technology already exists and has for a long time to improve that sort of, uh, that sort of scam, but they make it uh, um, obvious on purpose. And so the, these are, this is, maybe an example of where uh, we need to really think through what are, the, what are the motivations and constraints on the attackers and the defenders that we're trying to, to break through. Now there are a whole, a whole new set of scams, these voice scams, that are, that are maybe more convincing. And so uh, w when you can take a, a sample of somebody's voice and then use that to train an AI model that can then be very convincing that's, that this person has been kidnapped, well that, that's a new type of threat that we're not, uh, we're not already positioned to be aware of. We're starting to become much more aware of those. And so then now we're starting to see people make up defenses for those. And they're not even necessarily technical defenses. Uh, it's uh, one of the ones that people are, are starting to do is e exchange with their, with their loved ones these passphrases to be asked for that, will, uh, that they, can, they can use, these secret passphrases to, say, to, um, to request of the loved one who's uh, allegedly been kidnapped to verify. Anyway. You kind of get the sense. And so from a phishing standpoint, that's where we start to get more towards, towards conflict and, and cybersecurity. Uh, certainly we can write more, uh, a, a larger scale of phishing emails. Maybe we can't write them more convincingly. So are we trying to, are, are we worried about the spear phishing email that's sent to the CEO or the, or the chief security officer? Or are we interested in, in the wide blast of, of emails that are ind individually convincing to everybody? Well, you can already do both of those, and if you do the blast even in our, in our terrible uh, automated writing way now, they're still pretty convincing, they still work. And so what is really the, the new threat? That, that needs to be thought through at, a, at another level of granularity, not just now we can write convincingly so that changes the game. It, maybe it does, but in which ways? Um, uh, how, how far do I wanna go then? There's this, this is, that's all in the, text writing domain, but there's all sorts of other domains like patch writing and exploit writing for, for coding. Uh, but, and, and lots of people will, will talk about how AI can write patches and maybe that will save us in a defensive context, but if you look at the numbers, it turns out that patches are already mostly, 80% of the patches are already written before the exploit is even known. And then after that, it, even for the cases where where the exploit comes out first, where the vulnerability is discovered first, and they're in a rush to write the patch. That happens very quickly. The slow piece is not so much in the writing, but it's in getting people to, to put the patches on their systems, to update their systems. That's the slow bit. And so while we're, we, we think a lot about 
uh, or much has been written about writing patches faster with AI, that's not really the, the main problem to be solved. And so identifying which are the, the most important problems takes a little bit more scrutiny to think through. Uh, and maybe one more from this domain is, is in disinformation. So we, we talk a lot about disinformation from a, uh, an active standpoint. Like you can use these models to, to generate disinformation at, at a large scale and blast it out to everybody in a very mal malicious way. Uh, there's a, a more subtle way that we need to be thinking about these, is that if somebody just trains alternate models, if there are a whole suite of models to choose from, and you're, you're going to download whichever one you want, you might download the, most hi the highest performing one, but that might be trained in, in a, a, an adversarial country or one that just has a different data set that they're training from. Right now, there's a, uh, in, in the open world of models, there's the closed worlds of like open AIs and Googles and Anthropics. In the open world, there are a variety of other models that you can download and, and work from just uh, freely. Uh, Facebook or Meta put out some famous ones, but in the, the size of models, the, 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 in the download range that people are, are most interested in, that get the most, the most popular downloads, the, the highest performing right now is Baishuan 2, which is a Chinese model that, as I've played with it, uh, spits out answers to, to, uh, to all sorts of international questions that, that are not the ones that I would prefer it to, to be spitting out. And so I think it's important for us to, to consider disinformation that's a little bit less intentional, but still uh, just as risky. And then those models can also be manipulated in their training so that they can be controlled to, to maybe, you could imagine them being made to write software that's intentionally more vulnerable than, than is necessary, uh, just to weaken the, the security of everybody. All right, so those are issues that need to be thought through at maybe another level or two of granularity so we can identify what the real problems are and what the real opportunities are. Uh, moving on from there, um, the, sometimes I worry that the, the wrong lessons might be drawn from these private or industrial rule, uh, examples. That, uh, you can imagine that there are a, a variety of ones we could discuss, but uh, routing problems or autonomous navigation are, are big, big tasks that are important in, in the private world, but also in militaries. You, you need tanks or logistics to get to where they need to go, either being directed by by uh, setting up the map or just having autonomous vehicles. But in industry, it's not very adversarial context. For the most part, everyone wants everyone else to get from A to B as quickly as possible. In the military situation, that, that isn't necessarily the case. And they haven't been, these technologies haven't been built to deal with the adversarial nature. You can imagine, well, one of the, uh, one of the kind of fun examples, it was basically a, a, an art project, but it was done, I believe, in Germany where, where this, this one man got 99 of his friend's phones and put them in a little red wagon and walked them down the street so that Google would think there was a, a traffic jam and would route all of the cars off of this person's neighborhood street. Uh, now, that, that's kind of a fun example in, a, in just like a, an art project or somebody trying to protect their, their, uh, their noise ordinance, but uh, in a military context, that's probably all of the time. And these technologies haven't been designed to to accommodate those types of threats. And then on the topic of getting less scrutiny uh, that, that Sarah left us with, uh, there are a whole bunch that we can talk about there also. One of the things that I think about a bunch is uh, processing, exploitation, and dissemination of information, uh, of intelligence information. So you get a whole bunch of things from sensors, and somebody writes some, some report about those, and those get passed up to somebody else who summarizes and writes another report. And the, uh, over the process, uh, uh, over a, a long process, you end up going from uh, going report to report to some to some tight summaries at the end. Now, AI, these chatbots have become very good at at condensing a bunch of information, doing summarization, expanding out. You can imagine, without even necessarily even knowing that it was happening, a, a lot of these analysts might incorporate those tools, and and so now you're left with the question of how much of that was written by uh, artificial intelligence. How much was, how ready is artificial intelligence to take up those, those tasks? And how well do we even know how much artificial intelligence has entered into that process? Uh, those decisions that are made at the output of those can be very consequential decisions, but we might not uh, be giving the scrutiny required along those lines. 
Now, none of this is to say that these are impossible problems to, to tackle or that they won't be given their, their due diligence, but I think that discussions like this is where that due diligence starts. And so I'd like to leave you with that. Thank you, Andrew. And um, you, you pointed out some of the things that uh, uh, we were just discussing before the, before the event. I think what is really needed in, in the community is a sort of, the sort of reality check uh, when it comes to, okay, we're all hearing that AI has this tremendous potential, but how does that potential, you know, uh, survive contact with reality? And with reality, I mean, reality means different things. It means capabilities, it means concerns, it means environment, it means willingness to, and ability to incorporate this technology in various domains. So with you know, your remarks and, and the report that we've just launched is, I guess, goes in that direction, is goes in the direction of trying to bring down this very, you know, to a certain degree esoteric concept that is artificial intelligence down to some very concrete use cases that we can discuss and that we can uh, uh, really assess on the basis of what is, what is feasible and, and what is not. And the environment and the autonomous driving, I think it's a very good example of a use case that in the civilian world, the environment can be modified to ensure that the systems perform at their best. And even in that case, they're still not able to do that. Imagine, you know, if you have to kind of immerse yourself in an adversarial environment where your opponent is doing exactly the opposite. It's doing everything it can to make sure that those systems malfunction and perform the worst possible way. So that's definitely uh, something really interesting to, to think about. But I would like now to pivot to, to Beza. And uh, um, of course, you know, 2022, 2023, it, it can be considered as a sort of like a pivotal moment when it comes to the, the, the discussions within the UN, but also the national level that kind of elevated from exclusively focusing on lethal autonomous weapon systems to more broadly discuss about uh, AI in, you know, in the military domain and international security domain. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of that? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Giacomo, uh, for providing me the opportunity to speak uh, at the side event. Um, I can give you a brief uh, outlook of the UN discussions for sure. Um, generally, uh, the discussions that are happening at the UN uh, can be considered under two categories. Um, the, one of the categories, the big item, is really utili utilizing artificial intelligence uh, for good, uh, also known as the benefits and opportunities of, of artificial intelligence. Uh, in that regard, uh, most of the focus is really uh, is around AI for sustainable development goals uh, rather than letting AI to drive its own agenda. Um, the second category, and I think this is more relevant to the first committee, is that uh, the, the work of the UN really focuses on mitigating the harmful impacts of artificial intelligence. Um, and I would categorize that harmful impact for portion um, under also two categories. Um, the first category is really uh, around foreseeable risks. These are harms uh, that are already felt by people around the world uh, due to their day-to-day -day use uh, in armed conflict, uh, for instance, by marginalized communities, internally displaced people, migrants, or are the most affected one, uh, ones from these foreseeable risks. Um, and I don't, I think, need to remind uh, this uh, group that uh, AI models can learn uh, racist and sexist behaviors depending on their training uh, and, and uh, targeting and testing data. Thus, using AI in high-risk settings, I believe, is quite problematic, and we need to ensure that that, that risk is being mitigated. The set second category under those risks is unforeseeable, or perhaps to say it as yet foreseeable uh, risks. These are mostly unintended uh, high risk impacts of artificial intelligence. Um, and experts, what we had seen uh, scientific communities and expert community discussing them under existential risk category. Um, within the UN, the way that we are looking at it is is a broad scope and scale of those risks, from extreme risks to, to, the, to you can take it as catastrophic risks. And, and you, can, you can include an, into this discussion of integration of AI into weapon systems, including no, uh, nuclear command and control systems, 
our early warning, and the consequences of, of, of such integration and, and the use uh, with or without artificial intelligence is actually quite well known uh, within the international community. And another type of risk, of course, that's linked to this is AI posing risks on its own, uh, and, and, and that's more on the extreme side, ex existential side that, that we are being concerned of. Um, and for these unknown risks, I think we need to look at the problem a bit holistically as well. At least this is what at the UN we have been trying to do. Uh, there are certain hidden costs uh, of uh, developing and investing in artificial intelligence that actually has not been uh, come to the UN fora as much. Uh, these are, for instance, uh, for any AI model that you develop, you need to utilize and use minerals. You need to mine these minerals. Uh, lithium, for instance, is a scarce uh, commodity, uh, commodity, as well as um, semiconductors and so on. But also, there is a huge need to use uh, energy to build these large-scale uh, AI systems. And these costs, and there are many more costs that I can actually name, and these costs generally occur at the expense of, of the developing world. Uh, in fact, some, some actually call this as AI colonialism, uh, whereby the developments in AI only enriches the, the lives of the few. In this, in, in this regard, I think uh, big tech companies are, are um, benefiting a lot uh, from the investments. And if you look at the literature, you, you will see that resource scarcity and issues with climate change and, and so on have an impact on, on the drive to conflict as well. So that is also the importance of these hidden costs to international peace and security. Now, within the United Nations, uh, there are several entities that are looking at these issues, both from the opportunity side and, and the risk side. UNDP, ITU, UNESCO, the Secretary General's Office, uh, Office of the Tech Envoy, and, and UNODA are, are some of those. And every couple of months, uh, these entities come together virtually um, at the Under Secretary General and Assistant Secretary General level. So it's quite a high level discussion. And, and they discuss UN's approaches to artificial intelligence governance, uh, not only in terms of latest developments, uh, but also on coordination ac across the United Nations. Um, and there are some activities that, are, that have been happening at the UN as well. Uh, I think uh, some of those have been mentioned in the last uh, couple of weeks within the first committee as well. The Secretary General called for the formation of a high-level uh, advisory body. Um, we are expecting that body to be formed in the next two weeks. Uh, there will be around 30 to 35 independent um, experts as well as government-nominated experts within this, within this body. And the aim is for this body to look at governance options. Uh, the SG also has a scientific advisory board, uh, which is a bit different than the high-level advisory body. Uh, and that body is composed of 14 uh, scientists all around the world. Uh, they are currently looking at three issue areas, uh, biotechnology, climate change, and artificial intelligence. All three are actually quite linked to each other. Um, and there are, of course, efforts happening at the, at the global fora as well, at the UN fora. Uh, CCW on laws is, is you know, one of those to, to highlight. But also, I think, to break a little bit of the silos, uh, the Human Rights Council's advisory committee is also undertaking a study on uh, human rights implications of new and emerging technologies in the military domain. And relevant bodies within the United Nations also ask to provide inputs to that study. Uh, so ODA will, will do that from our end. Uh, and also on the cyber front, actually, the open-ended working group on information and communication technologies has spent a lot of time on, on issues related to threats, uh, different threats. And artificial intelligence have been one of the items that is discussed under, under that group. There are many activities that are happening also outside of the UN that I'll, I think, let Reto just speak a little bit on that as well. Uh, the, UK, the, the, um, the UK is doing an event, yes. Uh, the uh, Netherlands and the ROK are also championing the re-aim uh, responsible artificial intelligence work. The, the US is also doing some work. Our role as the United Nations, I think, uh, is that when states are doing certain events, we want to make sure that there is collaboration as much as uh, there can be, 
and um, and we want to limit re uh, repetitiveness in, in activities. So we guide states or give give advice to state as to the ways forward uh, and, and provide content-wise uh, clarity as much as possible. That's how I see our role on, on issues that are happening outside of the UN as well. Um, last point, I think, for this group is that ODA and uh, Republic of Korea are going to hold a two-day meeting conference in Geneva on December 4th and 5th. Uh, and all of the, I think, permanent missions in Geneva have received the invite from uh, UNODA and RAK to, to attend this meeting. It will be on AI in the military domain. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Beza, for, for providing us an overview of the many initiatives that are, that are happening uh, around the UN. And um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, um, you know, uh, also uh, uh, Reto, and I think it would be a great opportunity, uh, Reto, for you to, you know, as a representative of a member state, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on how the findings of the study can help your work and how can they be taken forward in the various initiatives that we, we see happening around us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Robin, Giacomo, Sara. It's a pleasure to be on this panel, and I'm honored to be flanked by uh, colleagues who have a much deeper, uh, more technical understanding uh, of the matter at hand. But as you said, I'm happy to say a few words from a delegate's perspective. Um, anticipating the various implications uh, of S&T developments is a Swiss priority outlined in our uh, current uh, Swiss arms control and disarmament uh, strategy. Across the board of the arms control topics, Switzerland wants to make the existing processes fit for mission, and we also stand ready to support new processes and initiatives where needed. We want to consolidate and strengthen the existing normative framework, work towards uh, guardrail, guardrails, including through prohibitions and regulations where that is needed. In particular, we want to ensure the respect of international law and in particular international humanitarian law and uh, um, to ensure that ethical and security considerations are also taken into account as we develop collective answers to these challenges. Uh, we have taken an active role on autonomous weapon systems in the CCW process in Geneva, and we have supported also bringing this issue here to New York last year with a joint statement coordinated by Austria. And this year, uh, as a member of a core group, we have tabled for the first time a resolution on autonomous weapons uh, systems, L56. Uh, we hope for strong support on this resolution, and we uh, encourage member states to come on board as co-sponsors of the resolution. Um, but a number of uh, tricky questions uh, need to be resolved to ensure that we get to broad, broadly carried international agreements and um, to, al to make sure that we can make use of the benefits that the technology offers while curtailing the risks and set guardrails where necessary. And we need to work really through these complex issues. And um, first, I think we need to come towards a common understandings of, uh, of what, the, what the issues are and what the challenges are and what the benefits are. And I think this study is an excellent, uh, an excellent example that helps us. And, and I want to commend really Unidir and the SecTech program for one more contribution. We have a very impressive work, uh, piece of work in front of us. I congratulate Sarah. Uh, it, it gives us a better picture in which direction AI applications will develop in the near future and what can be the advantages and the benefits of certain applications. What are the limitations? What are the risks? But also, as, as you mentioned, what are, what are the benefits? Found this whole list, the table, extremely useful. I would also add that this study presents everything in a quite understandable way, which was important uh, if you read it during the first committee, that you actually uh, can right, uh, jump into the, the key conclusions, and it's very, um, it's very helpful for me as a delegate. And I also hope that this can address the skill gap that the Secretary General mentioned that stands in the way at the national and global level to address the challenges in this field. I have just a couple of takeaways that I want to mention. First, and most obviously, is the scope that this study uh, takes. I mean. 
Um, it's very important, and uh, this study underlines it, to have a perspective that goes beyond the dimension of the weapons. To be clear, focus on weapons is incredibly important, perhaps one of the most important areas of our AI applications uh, um, that we understand the impact and address the possible risks, notably with the focus on IHL and IHL compliance. This is, this is of course, in incredibly important, but there are so many other points that are also to be considered across a range of applications and context beyond the target selections and beyond the use of weapons. So I think this underlines that we should pursue, of course, the focus on autonomous weapons, a topic that will hopefully further advance in the CCW based on a hopefully reinforced mandate uh, that could be adopted later this year. But I think that even if we manage to achieve the perfect result in the GGE on laws to deal with laws in the best possible way, it would still mean that we need something in addition. Uh, to deal with the broader topic. And probably that will be beyond the CCW, which has a focus on weapons and IHL. So in other words, I think this study should encourage us to think in parallel to our work on laws, uh, take a broader focus and look at all tasks relevant for military obligations. And in this regard, the, uh, um, what the study says about the upstream activities or the upstream capabilities is, was really an eye-opener for me. I uh, don't think it has received the necessary attention from states, at least I, I, don't, I don't think from the diplomatic community uh, this has uh, um, received the necessary attention. And it's, it's so incredibly important because what happens upstream will probably happen before and it will have implications also downstream. So. Um, it might be more acceptable, so it might just slip in, and then we have the consequences. So I think it, that really needs some considerations. Another takeaway is also that it is directly linked to what we do on laws. Um, yes, I'm following the autonomous weapons discussion, but a lot of the things that I see in this study are also directly relevant to, to our work and the other way around. I think a lot of the impressive conceptual progress that we've made in the uh, GGE laws is also relevant for the, for the broader picture. So if one day we might have multiple, one or two processes also looking at other AI military domain, AI security um, aspects, I hope that these processes can be interrelated and cross-pollinate um, because I do think it's, uh, it's really important to ensure that there are there's a, a, a exchanges on what the challenges are and how we can address it. I think there will be much to learn from the, uh, from the process. And I guess, let's assume we do first, we can find a res uh, response to autonomous weapon system. Maybe that can set a very good example of how we deal with other aspects uh, of, the, of the challenge landscape. Um, well, what does it also mean uh, from a perspective of a delegate? I think. As I mentioned, it has, we have to approach this with a broader focus. In laws, I mean, just I find it really striking. In laws, in the autonomous weapon system, some, some, some really want to have a focus exclusively on lethal autonomous weapon systems. Then others are comfortable talking about autonomous weapon systems or autonomy in weapon systems. And now we see the, br the broader picture. I think that is something we should all uh, keep in mind. As Besa referred to some processes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I think we have a, no a number of opportunities to make progress. The re-aim process that started in February in the Netherlands and will continue next year in South Korea is certainly one of the avenues where we can have this broader, uh, broader topic. I also think Pakistan has made a very good proposal to bring this into the Conference on Disarmament, where we have everything in place to work through these issues. In principle, it would be a primary um, process to take this forward. And you've mentioned also the, the UK AI Summit. I think that focuses very much on safety, but I do think that safety and security, and we perhaps also to a certain extent, it's not a, it's not a strict uh, separation. And I know they will also look at some biosecurity issues, for instance. So I do think 
that's another uh, interesting process. And I want to also say that the UNODA's work and the new agenda for peace, uh, the policy brief by the Secretary General and how this will be taken forward offers opportunities for states to engage and to be inspired and to see to what extent in this domain, science and technology, we can make a little bit more progress. Um, there is, for instance, the Indian science and technology uh, yeah, science and technology resolution, the role of science and technology resolution, that would be a vehicle to take things forward. Possibly, now we've seen a, an autonomous weapons systems resolution that could be maybe also one with a broader focus on AI in the military domain. Uh, so I do think that we will uh, be inspired uh, by the increasing activities, by the dynamic on this topic. I don't think we've seen more side events on these topics and more references in this topic in any uh, previous first committee. So we might be at a point where this will all um, keep us busy for, for a number of years. And, and in this regard, I think the study really is an excellent uh, basis for all of us to get ready for that. And I leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Reto, for your, for your uh, uh, kind and inspiring words uh, as well. Um, we now have about 20 minutes to get questions from the floor and from colleagues online. Um, before I open the floor, two very quick uh, acts of shameless self-promotion, but I think it's important. Um, we've heard about how AI governance and is, is becoming and is growing in importance. Some of you may be aware that we have recently launched our AI policy portal that is basically a one-stop shop for all of you to access almost uh, uh, updated in real time information about how different states are equipping themselves uh, with kind of the governance policies, documents, structures that would enable them to deal with AI in the military domain. Um, if you're interested in learning more for the entire week, just outside of where you're having your first committee meetings at Saudi F Conference Room 4, we have a little station set up uh, with one of our colleagues that is always going to be there to illustrate the, the, the portal and you can learn how to use it and what kind of information you can access. And then we heard a lot about the risks of AI. Uh, tomorrow we have another side event to present you another report that was launched Thursday last week where we focused exactly on how can we develop uh, a taxonomy or a common understanding of AI risks as, it, as they pertain to international peace and security. This is a first step or a first uh, phase of a study that we're conducting that aims at developing confidence building measures for artificial intelligence. But for us, before we can talk about confidence building measures, it was important to understand what are the risks that we're trying to, to mitigate. So if you're interested in learning more, please uh, do come in conference room six tomorrow. Um, the floor is open for any uh, questions that you may have uh, to our speakers uh, or any uh, um, uh, comments or um, observations you want to make on the topic of AI in the military domain beyond weapon systems. So who would like to go, uh, to go first? Please. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Julia Rodriguez, and I'm from the delegation of El Salvador. Thank you so much. I have um, find the, the results that you're presenting very useful. I think uh, that uh, we can agree with the colleagues here that sometimes AI is too broad to discuss the technical implications. So I think these efforts are important. So we, as a diplomats, can have more of a deep understanding. And I think it is very important because that highlights, for example, the difference between automatization versus autonomy that are two different concepts, for example, that in having like a clear example, it can be useful for the, the diplomatic labor. And I think that uh, in a broader context, highlight the issues of the core of the fourth industrial revolution and, and how AI, and then you can go into deep learning, machine learning, and neural networks and uh, deep learning and, as you say, highlight some of the long-term uh, concerns, like, for example, the, the societal risk that you talk about and also some of the short-term concerns as, as they were highlighted, for example, algorithm biases and human race safeguards. So I'm um, just wondering um, what would you be your opinions on 
which forum or how we can um, try to manage to discuss the broader security implications, like for example, on a geopolitical level, how we co can connect like big data, the super semiconductor race, and also quantum computing. I know this is a lot, but I'm trying to think more like, like in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful question to start off. Uh, we're going to take another and then uh, two more, and then we'll go back to our speakers. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for organizing this event and above all for, for preparing this report. I think the significance or the importance of this report lies in the fact that it's probably the first, the first one who really looks on, on these topics that go beyond the uh, topic of laws. And uh, I see many people in this room who are probably expert on laws but have little knowledge about the other implications and the other systems and the other uh, risks, but maybe also benefits we are to face in the future when we talk about the AI and the military use. And I count me among them. I mean, I don't really, uh, we don't have a full grasp of what is to come and what are the op opportunities and possibilities. And uh, such reports, and especially mapping exercises, are extremely important so that we can decide how, how to move forward. And, and many colleagues have already made important points. I mean, Reto, but also uh, the, the, the colleague who spoke before me on how important it is. Um, I have more technical questions that came up from the excellent presentations that we have received uh, um, today, especially from um, the, the first speaker and, and also the second one. Um, you have mentioned in the report or on, on the report uh, that there are cross-cutting issues that are uh, related to upstream and downstream applications um, as human control and so on. Um, I probably would say this also refers to or is true for bias, for, for automation bias, for, um, and for two other things that are probably very important, uh, such as machine learning and um, accountability and responsibility. So if you could give us a little bit more insight on your experience of thinking how, how machine learning and accountability and responsibility, which in the end goes through the whole chain of military command and on the whole structure, if it's upstream or downstream. I mean, what are your findings in this regard? Uh, and could you go, go into a little bit more detail on this? Uh, something that is, second point also for you, something that is really important that you have pointed out is, is the quality, integrity, and reliability of, of data. Um, I think this is also a topic that we have not uh, touched upon uh, enough, uh, also on the loss uh, issue. Um, do you have more information from your study? I mean, how do states actually acquire data and, and um, are there uh, kind of more, more, more acceptable and less acceptable ways of to acquire such data. Uh, and then also, is there possibly, and this is just a, a crazy idea that popped up today when I listened to you, um, would data be the area where TCBMs could have the most promising effect, more or less? Um, then up to our second speaker, I mean, you talked a lot about the, the human factor, about um, cyber vulnerability, Vulner vulnerabilities, um, but I would also be interested, I mean, how vulnerable are the AI systems themselves against cyber attacks, uh, especially, and this is maybe also our too heavy laws focus, um, how vulnerable are the systems who are acting in the field? Uh, and then also, what would an attacker actually do with a system that he has hijacked? I mean, would he, it, it, this is very hypothetical, but I think you are uh, very, um, you're the right person to answer this kind of question. Uh, but what would he do with these systems? Would he go deeper? Would he extract information? Um, would an attacker kidnap the system, or could he even use it to uh, attack civilians uh, for purposes of misappropriation, misperception, uh, misinformation? What, what are the possible horror scenarios we have to face? Thank you. Thank you. There were multiple questions in this intervention, so <laughs> I'm glad uh, you also took notes. Uh, we have one more, and then we come back to our panel. Thank you so much. I'm Hasham from Pakistan. I would just like to join others in commending Unidair uh, for this very important publication and for presenting this as well. Um, and, and we also believe that uh, the upstream risks and challenges have not been highlighted enough as when we compare it with the downstream links. So it, this really helps bringing out that perspective. 
and it helps to break down uh, those categories, the decision make, uh, making structures, the information assessment, logistics and training uh, to really uh, examine how at the operational level these upstream uh, challenges could play out. At the same time, we also believe that um, other than the operational level, just because of these capabilities, there are uh, there is another layer of uh, these challenges and risks that emanate from direct position and pursuit of these capabilities at the overall global and regional security level, uh, which could manifest itself in terms of intensification of new arms races, proliferation risks, uh, so that component as well. So this this conversation is very helpful, and we are looking forward to tomorrow's event as well. You talked about on, uh, on the developing a taxonomy, a common understanding of risks. My question is um, for Sarah or Beza. Anyone can answer on um, what comes in response to these risks. I know you uh, Unidir would uh, is planning already. Uh, study on uh, the response measures, what kind of CBMs as well. But my question is, taking a step back, uh, when we talk about military AI governance regime uh, in the future, uh, down uh, many years ahead, um, what would it look like? Would it include only CBMs? Would it include risk reduction measures? Would in, it manifest itself in some form of treaties, arrangements as well? and um, what kind of spectrum it would cover in terms of, uh, or it should cover in terms of the upstream risks, downstream risks, uh, in terms of foreseeing risks uh, in, in the future as well, or acting, uh, in uh, responding uh, once uh, an event has taken place uh, already uh, that carries catastrophic or existential threats. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually invite Joanna, who is re who, to kind of take note of this very interesting question that we may explore more during tomorrow's event. But also, given uh, the, the taking advantage of the panelists that we have, perhaps we can make the distinction between mitigating. So CBMs can are useful tool to mitigate risks that exist, you know, so to speak. But perhaps there is something that can be done in the development phase, you know, of an AI system to kind of a preempt certain risks from, from manifesting and from being there to start with. So perhaps since some of the, the risks that are more associated with the technology are well-known risks, perhaps, Andrew, you can talk about a little bit what can be done in, you know, in anticipation of certain risks, what kind of mitigation measures may exist from a more technical uh, perspective. And if you don't mind, we'll keep the political side of it to tomorrow's event. Um, uh, regarding more of the, the CBM uh, side. So we have a wide selection of, of questions, uh, starting with you know, how can we connect all of the different uh, uh, discourses on, on technologies, on AI, on quantum, on, on uh, uh, materials. We have something in relation to uh, how do we maintain clear chain of responsibility and accountability across the military domain uh, when we deploy AI. What are some of the vulnerabilities that we can think of about AI itself, what is the role of data? Uh, I always use the analogy that in the conventional world is well, is probably will make some people uh, smile or laugh, or I don't know. But I always say that data is to AI what ammunition is to small arms and light weapons. Can't do much with, an, with a, the most sophisticated AI model if you don't have the data to train it and to deploy it afterwards in the same way in which you can't do much with a weapon, with a small arm and light weapon if you don't have ammunition. So probably this means that at some point, states in the same way in which they came together to discuss ammunition, they should probably come together to discuss the data issue, which is an important issue when we're talking about AI. But I leave it now to our speakers. You're free to, to choose uh, in which order you would like to answer the questions. Perhaps we should start with you, Sarah, if you don't mind, and then Andrew, and then uh, Beza and, and Reto. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giacomo, and thank you for your questions and, and your uh, interest and kind words. 
Um, maybe I'll just follow on the data point quickly and answer that first and then go to the others. Um, it's interesting because when I first um, was kind of analyzing the findings, I didn't expect data to come to feature so prominently, um, but it became clear that uh, yeah, there's this is very central, but uh, it was not the focus, the ultimate focus of the study. So I'm afraid I don't have a very kind of acceptable answer to your question with regards to how kind of states, states acquire the data. But we will have a report, but correct me if I'm wrong, Giacomo, coming out on the synthetic data. Um, and I think that'll be quite interesting to explore kind of um, what is synthetic data and the issues and the challenges with that regard, because increasingly by multiple actors, it's being used as a replacement for data because data is um, obviously such a central part to kind of training and uh, using um, AI. So, so there is that forthcoming, which is looking at that particular issue with regards to, uh, to data. Um, with regards to the other question on kind of um, the cross-cutting risks of um, uh, kind of found in the upstream and the downstream tasks, um, it was quite interesting because when I grouped together the limitations and the challenges, I was struck by the uh, extent to which um, I was familiar with uh, all of them. So I don't know if that speaks to our biases because we're used to talking about the risks of AI with regards to um, application uh, to lethal um, systems um, or whether indeed there is this um, a crossover because regardless of its application, the same types of risks uh, will exist. Um, but a few others which I didn't necessarily mention, um, but I found uh, quite interesting uh, link to, obviously you have the same ones on, you know, to what extent would it have an impact to the operational tempo? Um, you know, there's, there's an argument that it could uh, lead to kind of um, a faster tempo and escalation, but I, uh, in the report, the, there's a mention that this really depends on to what extent the human is in loop, because ultimately they're the ones who still decide the pace. Um, so just because AI is included does not automatically mean there is an increase to the tempo. So I thought that's probably an interesting point um, to to highlight. Um, and I think uh, some some other things uh, are, of course, you know, I, I mentioned meaningful human control um, as part of the presentation, um, but there's also some elements around uh, or the reliance on AI and what it means to kind of um, perhaps an excessive reliance or uh, identifying tasks which AI is probably, uh, you know, s suited in a better sense because it can, uh, it has an ability to uh, analyze much broader uh, amounts of data, such as, you know, we take a lot longer to look at a video and identify what's uh, relevant in it than necessarily uh, in AI. Um, but there's that also element of, do we then categorize certain tasks to thinking this is an AI only tasks? And what does that therefore mean um, in terms of how we identify our strengths versus uh, machines? Um, and that's also interesting when it comes earlier on in the process because there are a lot more tasks and a lot more elements which can be um, kind of divided up um, between, between either humans or machines. Um, I, I, maybe I'll pause here to allow other speakers to answer. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, maybe you can speak about the vulnerabilities of AI systems. Thank you. Yeah, sure. There were a whole bunch of questions in there. Uh, and, and I guess for, for some of them, my, my answer is I don't know very much about it. And the other ones, I, like, I could speak for, for days. Uh, and then probably at the end, I would probably still say I don't know very much about it. Uh, well, the vulnerabilities in AI is one that I can talk for days and then say I don't know very much about it, so we'll start there. Actually, I've, I've written a, a, a variety of pieces on this one, uh, one also with Wyatt, who's, who's here at the table too, who's a co-author. We, um, I, I guess at a high level, in cybersecurity, we think that there are uh, things that can be achieved by attackers uh, in, in confidentiality, integrity, and availability. They can, they can get data out that's not supposed to be out. They can, in integrity, they can make uh, the systems do things they're not supposed to do. And availability, they can make them not operate when they're supposed to operate. And vulnerabilities in AI systems can also fall into all those three categories. You can steal data that's not supposed to be there. For example, uh, a model that's trained on a bunch of information that's supposed to be kept private, nobody's supposed to know about that, can at times be extracted out. You can get uh, like sensitive cryptographic keys that people have typed in. You can redraw somebody's face from a model that's supposed to take a face and spit out a, uh, a name. You can run it backwards and get their face out. Things 
things like that. Uh, integrity, these, these systems can be, um, can be made to operate in ways that they're not supposed to operate. Um, the, the most common or famous examples are where you take some picture and, and the, the model is supposed to spit out some label for that, like this is an F-35 uh, or this is a tank or this is a puppy or something like that. And you can tweak the, the, the picture just enough that nobody can tell the difference, but it spits out the wrong answer. Now, there's not actually that many cases where, where just tweaking an image in some imperceptible way is that important, but it shows that this vulnerability is very, very prevalent. People have worked hard to get rid of it, and they haven't been able to do so. Uh, well, how will that actually work in practice? Uh, one of the things that I like to think about, we, we've done, run some experiments where we try, to, we, we try to take some physical Jeep and drive it around in the desert with a, an actual drone looking overhead and see, can we make this, this Jeep disappear? And it's possible, but it's very difficult also. Uh, what maybe I'm more worried about is uh, somebody who takes a whole bunch of, of little sketched out patterns and throws them around so that the, the drone uh, thinks that there are many Jeeps that aren't actually there. That's just, uh, it, it kind of achieves the same, of, uh, the same effect of making this overhead imagery system uh, not useful. Um, and, and from availability standpoint, there are a variety of attacks that are mostly less interesting but, but are still possible. Um, I, I, I could comment on some of the other ones, but maybe I'll leave it for time and we can come back if necessary. Yes, we're conscious that we want to give you some time to stretch before you have to go back in the main, in the main session, but our speakers will be here if you want uh, after we, the event to come to them. Beza, would you like to, to add something in a minute? Um, sure, I think uh, on Andrew's point, the, the, the question about cyber and AI, is it's really a pertinent one. And if we think about it in terms of the, the protection of the critical infrastructure or the protection of weapon systems and so on, rather than just like day-to-day -day uses, what we're really, I think, concerned of is, uh, the, um, is the fact that AI-enabled systems can actually open up new, new nodes, new attack vectors in a system that may not have existed before. Uh, so that, that then can also a cause of concern for an attacker to come in and, and infiltrate into the system. Uh, the question then was about like what happens afterwards is, is a very hypothetical question in the sense that it really depends on where the attacker was able to get in and what type of uh, defense systems are there in the system and whether the attacker could be able to move laterally from one area to another. Uh, if it is on the command and control side, you would see different type of consequences. If it is on the communication side, you might see different consequences. So it really depends on where the attacker is and, and what the intent of the attacker is. Because the attacker might be just there to sit still and, and, and observe for that time being. And, and the states of concern may not even be aware that, that uh, they have been in, their systems have been infiltrated. Um, so that's just like a, in a nutshell. Um, on the first question from El Salvador, I think it's a really important one. Uh, Retro and I have been uh, thinking about this as, uh, as well um, in the sense that how are we going to connect all of these issues and how, how, how should we be thinking about the convergences of the, these areas? Um, I think that there, there are different ways to look at it. One is um, UN Disarmament Commission, for instance, uh, you, you, you can put it as a second issue item on emerging technology convergences. That's, a, that's one, one item that I can think of. You can, of course, start a first committee resolution on the subject of convergences of emerging tech rather than just looking at artificial intelligence. So that's also another uh, aspect, I think. Um, group of states can come together and look at the issue outside of the UN. Um, that's another, I think, area. But what I think we are missing is that there are some elements, for instance, we have the MPT, we have different treaties, we have the OEWG on ICTs and so on. And some of these bodies are already working on those issues and others are not, are, others are not concerned about emerging technologies. So there's this ad hoc uh, way of working uh, on, on many of the issues that we discussed. Maybe institutionalizing it and, and making sure that all of the existing um, buddies also look at these issues 
and emerging technology challenges and risks might be a good way of starting it. And of course, uh, I think UN Security Council could be also another uh, fora. AI has been discussed there. Uh, cyber has been discussed there as well. Uh, the issue, however, has not been uh, regularized or, or institutionalized within the Security Council yet. Um, I think I'll stop there. I was going to answer one more question. Oh, yes, Pakistan's question. Just very quickly, one line on this. Uh, the response, I think all of the above is your response. So you were asking about should, we, should it be on risk reduction, should it be on treaties, should it be on uh, TCBMs. The, the Secretary General's new Agenda 4 piece called for specifically on AI in the military domain to, to establish norms, rules, and principles uh, as, a, as a starting point. But it is not to dismiss that that legally binding measures could, could be achieved in the longer run. I think it's really fundamental for states to come together in this discuss what would be the best way uh, forward. And all of the points that you raised are, I think, important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reto, you have uh, any final thought you want to share? Yeah, just to um, perhaps build on what Faisal just said in response to the delegates from, Sel from El Salvador. Um, so I think when we look at what, uh, what processes we launch, we need to have a clear picture of where we want to go. And I think um, obviously one of the, one of the key uh, criterions for, 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 for my country would be that it's in the United Nations where we have the broadest uh, possible, uh, the biggest chance to be um, broadly supported. A key criterion in, in, is for us inclusiveness. Uh, the key military states, the key developers, the users, the producers, of course, we would like to have them on, on, on board of any future uh, process. Uh, in laws, we always, uh, of course, um, think that we have to have those who will develop um, such weapons. Now, with the, with the scope of this study, there is, of course, a whole other group of states that might never uh, develop an autonomous weapon system, but they might use a lot of these capabilities that are listed in the report. So the broader membership, uh, a, a really a, a, a true inclusiveness uh, seems important to me. Uh, also often we refer to multi-stakeholder approaches. We need to ensure that the process is really open for scientific community, for business, for uh, the technical experts that are involved in the AI uh, governance uh, uh, alongside the government, al alongside the governan governments. Um, and, um, and then I would, say, I would think we should also think about synergies. Um, International Geneva already uh, sees different ecosystems uh, where such questions are dealt with. Uh, with regard to digitalization, there's a lot of uh, international organizations, uh, research institutes such as UNIDIR, but also other international organizations dealing with, dealing with new tech, new tech um, um, new tech challenges and because quantum technology came up I want to just raise the attention that just earlier this week in Geneva our foreign minister launched the Open Quantum Institute uh, by the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Accelerator and this is developed together with the CERN um, and uh, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's one, of these, uh, one of these elements that can really be uh, interesting in the, in the near future for the broader for the broader uh, new tech uh, governance discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Reto. And uh, thank you all for staying with us, even if we overran by uh, a few minutes. I think this has been a great event. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and to all of you for the great questions. As I mentioned, this is the beginning of a journey for us. This report is it's the, where we start, it's not where we end. So you can expect to hear more from us on this topic. And I do hope also to see uh, most or all of you tomorrow at our event. With that, please join me in a round of applause for our speakers, and I wish you a great rest of the day.